You need to know the feeling of great fitting underwear that is two times softer than cotton. You need to know about MeUndies.com. MeUndies is the most comfortable underwear you will ever wear, and it's insane how good they make you feel. They sent me some. Trust me, they're great. Throw your saggy underwear away, people. Throw your underwear with holes away. Go to MeUndies.com slash BS and get 20% off your first order plus free shipping. Save even more when you buy a pack. They'll guarantee you'll be happy your first pair is free. Once you feel MeUndies on your body, you're never going back. And the Bill Simmons podcast is also brought to you by HBO because they were nice enough to give me my own television show that launches next spring. Thank you, HBO. You don't need cable or satellite to watch HBO anymore. Download the HBO Now app and start your free one-month trial today. Okay, hopefully this is the last podcast I will ever do that doesn't have entrance music because I think I have figured out the entrance music. One more guy says yes, and we're ready to go on Friday. But for now, no entrance music. But I do have Casey Wasserman, my old friend. You went on the podcast once before. How many years ago was that? Must have been five or six, but it, nothing has ever elevated my popularity like your podcast. So I oh, feel, is that true? That's unbelievable. Is it, it was a bump? Among 18 to 24-year-olds, I got infinitely more valuable and popular. Oh, that's great. Well, now you're going to be more popular because... So, all right. So I'm conflicted on this because I don't think... Any American city should have the Olympics except for Los Angeles, which is actually built for the Olympics. And it makes a ton of sense. And I was in the middle of this whole thing because I'm from Boston. Boston won the bid over Los Angeles. And I knew it was going to be a disaster. I know you can't say that much, but Boston's the most provincial place on the earth. Um, it doesn't have any of the infrastructure it needed. And it made no sense whatsoever. And everyone in Boston realized this pretty much immediately and got rid of it. They threw it out like they did with the British. And you were sitting there waiting. You're running the uh, LA bid for for uh, the 2024 Summer Olympics. And now you have a chance. So who do we have to take out? Paris? First, I want to thank you for... Uh saying all the things you did about Boston during that time, because it was all the things I was thinking and couldn't say. So it made me feel <laughs> infinitely better that at least someone was right. saying them. I was being politically correct and you could not be, which was very helpful. So it's uh, LA against, and we are the official US city. Yeah. Uh, Paris, Rome, Hamburg, and Budapest. So four European cities and us. And uh, September of 2017, I think we should do the podcast from Lima, Peru, which is where the announcement will be. Oh no. How good is that? Lima, Peru? Come on. That's where it's going to be. That's so you have, <laughs> so you have two years basically. Two you have years. Twenty six months. Correct. It's two years, and it's really two missions. One is over the next two years to develop a fully baked Olympic bid in every sense of the word: venues, traffic, security, infrastructure, venue agreements, all the stuff that it takes to actually put a games on. Yeah. And on a completely parallel path, there's roughly a hundred IOC members who we need to connect with, um, be humble, earn their trust, earn their respect, because what they decide in 2017 is to give you their most valuable asset for seven years. And once they give it to you, it's yours to, to bring to life. And that's a big decision for them to make. It's arguably the most important decision they all make. Uh, and, and I believe that they're gonna pick the city that they trust and respect and that they believe will do for the Olympics what they want done. Okay. so. Let's go through the other cities. So Paris hasn't had it in a long time. Correct. So uh, And it's one of the great cities in the world, and it would seem like that would intrigue them. No question. Same for Rome. I would say London, Paris, and Rome are probably the three most famous non-American cities. Right. Um, Budapest, I'm not feeling. I Budapest, think they're on the outside looking yeah, in. Look, it's a great city. This is a, this is a big undertaking uh, yeah. for any city, but for a city like Budapest, really massive, without the economic infrastructure that you know, a Hamburg, a Rome, or a, or a Paris have outside of LA, obviously. Look, the the, the interesting thing is, uh, it's the 100th anniversary of Paris from 1924. That's uh, not good. That cuts both ways though. 1996 was the 100th anniversary of Athens, which you would think would have been an obvious choice. Yeah. And they took it to Atlanta. Right. Not exactly. Uh, Does your, Atlanta your... hurt this? Because Atlanta, I think, was considered to be... Um maybe not a roaring success. Whereas in 84, Los Angeles was considered to be a success. It was 2002, despite the hiccups they had getting there was a big success in Salt Lake. Yep. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, the United States is an important market for the IOC. That's not why they would pick us, but it's yeah. just an important piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, Paris is clearly the favorite today. Uh, and our job is to be consistent and relentless over the next two years uh, and make as few unforced errors, frankly, as possible. Yeah. Um, 
and put ourselves in a position to succeed. The dynamic, if you want to sort of play game theory, for European cities, there are 45 IOC members in Europe. Oh, so, so you're saying they might, it's almost like the Oscars where if you have three people from the same movie, they take each other's votes. That, that's our, that's part of our hope. Uh, and, and we need to do a good job. If we don't do a good job, none of that matters. But, um, um, you know, we need to be your, your non-typical American bidder. We need to do this with humility, which is important. Yeah. Uh, no, this is, we can't assume it's America's time because frankly, there's no such thing. Right. Um, and we need to, we need to go earn this. And it's a tough competition. It'll be an interesting two years. It'll certainly be a wild ride. That's for sure. So you have how many IOC members in the United States or total? Or just total. How There's many? a hundred total. They have the hundred ability, total. They have the ability to go up to 116. So the next time they will move some in and out uh, is in Rio. They have a, if they call it a Congress um, around the Olympics. So some people age out, they bring in new members. So I'm sure it'll grow a little bit, but roughly a hundred members. And most votes wins. <clears throat> most votes wins. The low vote getter until there's a majority gets removed from the process every round of voting. Oh, that so, should have happened to Lincoln Chafee. <laughs> <laughs> and a few Republicans. Yeah. Uh, a few other Republicans could have, uh, could have suffered that same demise. So, you know, to be fair, the last two American bids lost on the first round. They were removed on the first ballot, so to speak. Uh, and we need uh, to keep that in perspective. It just shows you how much work we have to do. So, but this isn't like FIFA, right? Like FIFA, everyone knew at all times was the most corrupt thing going on and it made no sense. This is like there are real rules and regulations and laws they have to follow, right? There are, and the IOC has done an incredible job of, I think, distinguishing themselves from FIFA. The other difference is uh, when FIFA votes for World Cups, they do it through their executive committee, uh, which is 22, 23 people. You don't, you don't need to influence that many people to win. And influence you can deem yeah. to be whatever you want it to be and whatever was assumed to have happened. The IOC, it's every member gets a vote. Uh, so hard to influence in that kind of way 50, 60 people without yeah. it being really obvious and really public. And we should mention just your background a little bit. You grew up here. I did. Born and raised in L.A. I was 10 in 1984, so I remember those games well. I oh, so some, you went to those. I do. I have some really embarrassing pictures of some Michael Jackson-esque attire i was wearing in 1984 was awkward really, shorts I, I, uh, shorts the vest crazy hair the, the vest yeah so you were i mean your grandfather was one of the most powerful people in la i'm sure you had good seats for some I of did. those he was one of uh three co-chairs of those uh, yeah. olympics so went to a lot of events it was other than carmageddon the least traffic there's ever been uh, in los angeles so it was a fun time to be here so you think people cleared out they did it was amazing. You could have walked down the 405 naked and no one would have hit you. Oh my God. That's a been a dream of mine for years to walk down the 405 <laughs> naked. I was, so I was living in Connecticut that summer because my parents had gotten divorced and my mom remarried my stepdad. And so I was in Connecticut kind of going back and forth there in Boston. But I remember watching most of those games in Connecticut. The Russians didn't show up. They didn't. The boycott was, people forget that. Uh, that, that hurt. It hurt, but it's also one of the reasons I think the games were such an extraordinary success in this country because Americans <laughs> like to win. Because we won everything. Exactly. Yeah. So, it you know, winning is good. Uh, it's good for business. Uh, what's interesting is the Russians boycotted was the first time the Chinese government sent a full team. Yeah. Also the greatest expansion in 1984 of women's participation. They used to actually limit, show you how much the world's changed. They used to limit that uh, women couldn't do distance events in track and field and swimming. So the first time the marathon was in the Olympics was in 1984 for women. Joan Benoit won. I remember. Um, yeah, because yeah. they didn't think women could run a marathon. It was crazy. So LA- it was a little it, sexist back then. In addition to a lot of other things it did for the Olympic movement, um, embrace the Chinese um, um, team uh, warmly, expanded the women's program dramatically. Uh, and so LA has a lot to be proud of from 1984. Well, and then the other thing that happened was there's no Olympics in 1980 because we don't go. The one that happened before then was 1976. Which bankrupted Montreal, essentially. Which, yeah, but that was the first one I remember. I'm I'm 46 now. So I, you know, I was in on Nadia Comaneci and Sugar Ray Leonard and Bruce Jenner and all that stuff. But then eight years passes, and I think people had forgotten how awesome the Olympics was. So that LA Olympics happened. It was just TV constantly. I, I remember watching like women's volleyball games at like 12.30 at night. I'm thinking like, this is great. This is it, the greatest thing that ever happened to me for two and a half weeks. It was. It that was, was when the Olympics arrived in America, it felt it, like. It did, no question. And it, and it was a great moment for the Olympic movement. It showed what it can be, both for a city and a community and a country, but also how, how much success it can create if, if operated and done right. I mean, financially, the LA Olympics still 
generates benefits today, LA84 is a $200 million foundation that exists entirely from the profits of the 1984 Olympics that funds youth programs all over the city. It's a, it's this unbelievable legacy. The legacy of those games is touching people every day as opposed to the legacy of the games in Montreal is a stadium, you know, that, that they struggled with or, or buildings that they didn't need. And we don't, right. we don't have that legacy in LA. And I think it's one of our great attributes is we've got an unbelievable sporting infrastructure here. I mean, unbelievable choices for venues. Yeah. Not just where it's do we spread do things, out. but which ones do we use? Cause we have so many, there'll be unbelievable venues. We may not even touch. Yeah. Which is an odd thing. Um, and that's why I'm a big supporter of this because, you know, probably the highlight of my entire stint at ESPN was going to the 2012 Olympics in London and writing from those for Grantland. I took my family. We were there for three weeks. The weather cooperated amazingly. Your team handball story was pretty epic. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I wrote eight times. I probably wrote 30,000, 35,000 words. And it was awesome. And, you know, I think one of the reasons it was awesome is because London is a big city that was spread out and it had a good transit. And you could kind of get from point A. There was a lot of walking. I don't think I don't think anybody realized how much walking there was going to be the <laughs> Olympic Village, but it was spread out and it worked. And I feel like LA is the only American city that could kind of capture what London was like because it's spread out. And everybody's like, "Well, the traffic, whatever." As you said, people clear out for the Olympics. They either rent out their houses or they're afraid or whatever. But the venues no other city has this many venues correct and, and we don't even know about the football stadium right correct. i mean, I mean we it, think that's coming and it wasn't even part of our bid because yeah it's a pure bonus if they build it um which is an odd thing to think about a you know a billion to billion and a half dollar facility that will one of one of which will get built in the city that we didn't even put as part of our plan right other people and you're are, not paying for it and we're not paying for it uh and so the other benefit to it being really spread out and the in the sort of the infrastructure not just of transportation we have here but of hotels is that you know, if you go to events in Santa Monica, as as visitors, you can stay in Santa Monica and never have to leave Santa Monica and see half a dozen events. Or if you want to yep. stay downtown LA, you can see 15 events within walking distance and stay at those hotels. So it also, that's the other part where the traffic gets reduced is because we have hotels everywhere and infrastructure everywhere and restaurants and, and everything that people do when they come to an Olympics, you don't need to be trucking across town all the time to go to events. And it's a really valuable thing. It's what happened in London. So we're going to have this new football stadium that Cronkies building. <laughs> we're going to have the Rose Bowl. We're going to have the Staples Center. You assume they'll knock down the convention center and build some sort of other something right there next to it, right? Well, they'll build, they'll, they'll, the part of the city's plan is to renovate the convention center, expand the square footage. Convention centers are really valuable for Olympics because right. a lot of events, as they did in London, you have these big exhibition halls where you can have 10, 12 events existing for the Olympics and Paralympics. Um, you know, you're going to have the, the Coliseum, uh, USC, the Coliseum, renovating. you have the forum, the forum, you have the new, uh, LA football, uh, soccer MLS team, building a new stadium next to the Coliseum, which our plan has for swimming. Right. So, so you have UCLA, we have UCLA, which has a little a USC, a lot of USC. You got the beach, which is extraordinary. I mean, beach volleyball and the place where it was invented in Santa Monica beach. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have Carson, California for, we do. I mean, do you even use those in we this? We do. We, uh, are, are the plan we proposed to the USOC had rugby at, at StubHub Center, their velodrome, obviously, and then yeah. tennis at their tennis center, wow. which, which exists down there. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, 84 had no events in the Valley. We have a huge uh, aggregation of events in the Valley at, at uh, Balboa Park, um, equestrian shooting, archery, some really cool whitewater kayaking, really cool stuff. Uh, we don't even have to use um, some events they use in 84 because the infrastructure is growing so much. Staples Center is obviously extraordinary yeah. uh, for gymnastics and basketball. Um, so the basketball is going to be, <laughs> that'll be at Staples, basketball, I would guess, right? It's, it's interesting. Basketball um, will probably be at Staples for the finals. Uh, we've thought about, you know, um, embracing California a little more broadly for some sports like basketball. Um like doing something in Anaheim, or you could maybe do it in Anaheim. You could do it in Oakland, at Golden State. If they build a new facility, Sacramento. I mean, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure in this, let alone the country, the state that we can yeah. use for basketball, men's and women's. I don't like that idea. You don't. I want it to be at the Staples Center. I want it to be 20 minutes from my house. Just <laughs> okay, zoom down well, there. I promise you, the finals will be at Staples <laughs> well, Center. You. How about that? Thank you. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> and gymnastics. So we've got a great uh, a great plan, and we'll continue to evolve and develop, and you know, we'll put our best foot forward. And the TV ratings would be out of control out of because control. you'd be able to control basically all the prime time, everything. Correct. And you can do 
because of the weather and the environment, you can do things at night in prime time here that you may not be able to do in other cities. Obviously, for yeah. NBC as the broadcaster, extraordinary opportunity. Does the IOC do they even care about like American TV ratings? Is that a factor to them, or do they get a, like do, do they have any incentive? They they don't. NBC has acquired the rights already right. through 2032. Um, so they are locked and loaded for a long so time. So the IOC the doesn't care about TV ratings. No. What, what do they, they care about? I think what they care about is that that cities understand the values of the Olympics beyond 17 days of games. Uh, they want the Olympics to be a positive contributor to a city. They they're trying to make people understand that Sochi was an aberration, not the standard operating procedure. That this 51 billion dollar number that got thrown around with Sochi is not what the Olympic Games is about. Yeah. Uh, and and Thomas Bach, who's the president of the IOC put forward Agenda 2020, which is a dramatic revamp of games, both in presentation and bidding, um, reducing the burden on cities, which is really important. I think LA is a city that fits that mold well. I'm sure some of the others we're competing against do too. Um, and they, look, they need to continue to stay relevant in a world where being away for two years between a winter and a summer or four years between two summer or Olympic or winter games is a long time, much longer than it used to be. You know, when we were kids, four years between 84 and 88, you know, not that much happened. Now, yeah. uh, in, in the minute the Olympics is over, there's there's stuff going on, and so the pace has has quickened. It feels like the World Cup is on the corner a lot now, too. No question. Every summer, there's something. <clears throat> no question. And so, the Olympics need to continue to stay connected and relevant. Uh, they are they are changing the Olympic program in terms of sports. Tokyo will introduce new sports. In Rio, they're introducing golf. So yeah. you're gonna have. Ricky Fowler and Jason Day and That'd be cool. superstars like that playing golf in the Olympics, which is a really cool thing. So they're, they're modernizing their program while staying true to the ideals of Olympism. And they want cities to embrace that. Uh, they want cities to be sustainable and not so sustainable environmentally, but sustainable economically. Uh, and so, and doing that well allows more cities around the world to have the opportunity to host the Olympic games. All right, let's go devil's advocate. So, if I'm an American and I hear, oh, an American city is bidding for blank, your guard goes up because this has been screwed up a lot of times and um, in a variety of different ways, whether it's billionaires making people pay for their new NBA arena um, or something like this with the Olympics where you saw what happened in Atlanta and Montreal and wherever else where it's like, well, you, so am I going to end up paying for stuff here? Like, is this going to hurt my taxes? Why do we need this? With LA, we have a lot of this stuff already, but what would you say to somebody who's like, this is stupid. Like we have so many other things to worry about in America. Why do we even need an Olympics? I, I look, I need is a hard word to, to compare with. Does, does LA need the NFL? Does LA need the Olympics? It's not about right. need. I think we are a better city, uh, in many ways, having hosted an Olympic games in 84. And I have no doubt the same would happen in 2024. Right. We are unique to your point, uh, relative to a place like Boston to be able to host these games. Um, same with like Chicago. I feel the same way. I don't think Chicago would have worked either. And San Francisco would have been a disaster. That no, place is way too crowded. <laughs> that place couldn't have handled no, Olympics. No question. So we're, we're unique. We are a, a, a true Olympic city. We embrace the ideals. We have the infrastructure. Uh, our plan uh, is, you know, the architects we're working with in developing this plan who are doing Rio, who did London and who are doing Tokyo, they said they've never seen a city more ready to host an Olympic Games in Los Angeles from an infrastructure perspective. Right, because you don't have to build anything. Like in yeah. London, they had to build every the giant 80,000 seat stadium. Correct. They had to build another soccer place. They had to build the whole village. And what they they knocked most of that stuff down after. Well, right? they're still trying to get West Ham to take over the soccer stadium yeah. or the Olympic stadium to turn into a soccer stadium. Our infrastructure is really unique, and that allows us to focus on the athletes. So that right. becomes a games where instead of the seven years leading up to the games, people are talking about cost overruns and construction problems and security and traffic. For seven years, I think we'll be talking about the greatest experience for the world's greatest athletes in a unique American city. And look, in many ways, Los Angeles is different than lots of American cities. I mean, you know, Boston is an American city. Los Angeles is kind of a global city. We're part of California, this really unique place in the world, yeah. not just in this country. And optimism and creativity that, that exists in this city and this state is, 
unique in this country and we're really far from everything else. You know, people think about America, they think about the East Coast. You've yeah. now we've gotten you to the right side of the coast and of the world and, and it's a different part of the, this country and we think differently and we operate differently. Our connectivity to the world is different and we need to embrace that and, and show the, the Olympic movement how that can benefit them. We, so you've been here your whole life. I've been here for 13 years. It's funny, there's a wave now of LA is the next great American city stories because LA is the second biggest city in America. And you, that, that's just a weird thing to say, but I can feel it being here. And you can feel like, you know, the way the city is now expanding, where you have businesses that moved into Venice and Playa Vista, like Snapchat and all those people, they moved to Venice and Playa Vista has all those people. And now you have even like the Hollywood Vine Sunset area, you have Netflix going there and Viacom and a whole bunch of people. East LA, BuzzFeed's gonna go down there. And it feels like the city's just just kind of expanding, almost like our, like the Michael Jordan Wings poster. <laughs> it's just getting I had that, wider. I had that probably in 1984 yeah, also. Yeah, yeah. Um, Do you feel that though? It, I, it just feels like the city's getting bigger and more interesting. I, I totally agree. And if you think about the great cities of the world, New York, Tokyo, London, Paris, big global cities, LA is a young city. Yeah. And it's also the only city of those that I think will look dramatically different 50 years from today. I, I agree. I think New York will look like it does kind of today. There'll be new buildings and different buildings, but LA, when you got here 13 years ago, you couldn't get arrested downtown. Now people live downtown. They have supermarkets downtown. Venice was where you went surfing. Now one of the most popular companies in the world is there. We're building rockets at SpaceX, you know, right. in LA. So LA. And, may, and maybe Englewood, if the football stadium goes there. Total massive now that becomes yeah that and becomes a place. If you too. think about that, we've got uh, we've got a, a billion and a half to two and a half billion dollar football stadium being built in the city somewhere. Uh, you've got a ten billion dollar modernization project of our airport. You've yeah. got thirty billion dollars in in transportation infrastructure as as metro being built here, having nothing to do with the Olympics, having nothing to do with anything else. The biggest cultural project in the world is going to get built in LA in a couple of years with the rebuilding of LACMA. Uh, you know, you've got this incredible rebirth of art and fashion and commerce and all this stuff happening in LA. The food scene in LA, I'm not a big foodie, but the food scene in LA the is, food scene's incredible. is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, it's really, it's gone to a whole other stratosphere. Different parts of the city. I mean, you go to places downtown. I mean, even east of downtown, there's unbelievable restaurants. It's, yeah. it's totally changed. And I think 50 years from now, LA will be a different city. And as the mayor likes to say, the Olympics is one of those things that can elevate this city in a way like few other things can. Well, it seems like we have a good mayor now. I know you've been dealing with him. Uh, my friend Kimmel's been <laughs> friends with him for a while. It, it, you know, I've had some bad mayors in my life, especially like in Boston. Uh, this guy actually seems like he's headed for bigger and better things. Isn't that bad for you ultimately? If like, well, what happens if he becomes a governor or a senator? Well, uh, he, he's mayor through, uh, for sure through, if he gets reelected through the vote in September 2017, and there is no question, uh, I'm working for him on this bid. He is our yeah. greatest asset and advocate here. He's a remarkable guy. It makes you and I look like complete failures. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's headed, he's going to do stuff. You know, Road scholar, yeah. naval intelligence officer, speaks fluent Spanish. I mean, you know, you and I are schlep rocks compared to this guy. And, yeah. and his, uh, his ability to be a leader in the city and to be an advocate for this city outside uh, this he's country. done an awesome job it, and i don't i'm remarkable. not a huge politics guy and I, I don't lean one way or the other really with stuff like that but he's just really impressive and he really seems like he cares about the city he wait does. i have um it's time for the biggest mailbag question ever okay presented by our old friend stamps.com you hate going to the post office it's miserable awesome. who likes going to the post office nobody likes it uh i wish that i knew a better way to mail and ship stuff Oh, stamps.com. I could do it on the internet. At stamps.com, you can buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter or package using your own computer and printer. You can have your assistant do this for you. I'm in. Uh, even better, if you sign up for stamps.com and use the promo code BS, you get a four-week trial plus a $110 bonus offer that includes postage and a digital scale. With digital scale, you can weigh anything. It doesn't have to be just postage. Go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in BS. That's stamps.com, enter BS. Here's the biggest mailbag question ever. Where the heck is the Olympic Village gonna be if LA gets the Olympics? There's no question that's our biggest challenge. It's- uh, Well, so you don't have an answer yet. So we have a group of sites we're exploring. The, the site we talked to the USOC about was something called Piggyback Yards, which is owned by Union Pacific. 
right on the LA River, which would be a great location as part of the LA River redevelopment. Okay. Uh, so the program is you have to build roughly four to 5,000 units to deliver 17,000 beds. So a bed for every athlete for 17 days, plus you, the Paralympics. Couldn't you just use UCLA? So uh, is, that are, a, is that like a possibility or no? It's a possibility we're exploring for sure. UCLA and USC have both dramatically increased their housing. Uh, yeah. In 1984, they had a split village, which you can't do anymore for security reasons, which is obvious. The athlete experience is fundamental to the Olympics. So having oh, them yeah. in one place is, is vital. I think both UCLA and USC are real. Um, working closely with the city, we've actually got 20 sites we're looking at. Uh, we don't talk real openly about them because we don't want someone to go buy them and exploit them. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so be careful, Bill. Um, uh, but having said that, uh, it, it is clearly our biggest challenge. The good thing is two uh, fold. One, there's clearly a shortage of housing in Los Angeles. So a private developer partnering with an Olympics uh, to build housing that at least in some or in whole is for low income housing is a huge opportunity for the city and a huge need. The second thing is we have no shortage of developers who are yeah. interested in doing this. Um, if we had to pay for it and finance it all ourselves without an outside developer, without uh, after use in thought, we couldn't do it. So we have the use case, we have the need, and we have a lot of partners who are interested in doing it with us. And so now we've got to find the best site that works. Fortunately, we have uh, a, a few that are really interesting. They're uh, in the city center. They're close to where the heart of the games will be here. And now our job is to put together a, a feasible, deliverable opportunity as part of our bid. All right, I'm gonna have to ask this question. Who's paying for stuff? Which part, the, the bid part? Just, just everything. So the bid is completely privately financed. So we've raised uh, $35 million. Uh, as soon wow. As, as soon as we got the call from the USOC, um, I started getting on the phone. Uh, thankfully, for fortunately, you, I, you know some, I, I didn't some get, people. I didn't get to you, so you know. I'm I, waiting. I, I, I'm here. <laughs> uh, uh, we raised it in about a week, uh, which is great. Um, great leadership from the community, so that will fund the bid. That's the next two years. That'll pay for everything in that bid. Completely. What do you need to get to? Do you uh, know? Uh, probably a little more, but that that'll take us most of the way. Good. Um, uh, that's good. That's really good. And then here's what happens when um, the the IOC picks their city. So. September 2017, uh, hopefully it's LA, but whatever city they pick, here's the proposition they deliver you. Uh, they give you their most valuable asset, the hosting of the Summer Olympic Games. Uh, they tell you for the next seven years, you can exploit that opportunity in any way you want. Your commitment to them is to deliver those games, period. And then they give you a check for $1.7 billion. Whoa. And that is your share of sponsorship and television revenue for that games. Okay. Today, they've told every city to, to budget $1.7 billion. So you take all of that money, and that's how you pay for the games, and your goal is to not go over that number? No, because then we get to sell tickets and sponsorships and torch relays and Oh, so it's even more lottery. than that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know, a city can generate 4 to $5.5 billion of revenue. Wow. Depending on the city, depending on the environment you're selling in. You know, Just for some, some markers, uh, Tokyo... Their budget was, they got a guarantee actually for 1.5 billion sponsorship revenue. Uh, it's not for a long time and they're already well over that. Uh, Rio will do about 1.3 billion in ticket sales. So those are very realistic numbers, which is what gives us a lot of confidence in our ability to deliver these games um, with as little risk as possible. And you're ready for this whole, like starting around a year before the Olympics, if, if LA gets it, the, uh, hey, Casey, uh, can I have tickets? <laughs> I was thinking Bill and Casey's ticket broker house could be a good We'll get business. Nathan. Right? That'll be Nathan Hubbard's Done. next job. Done. How good He'll is just that? He'll <laughs> just own all the tickets for that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you're going to have a lot of people hitting you up for a lot of stuff, but you're ready. You're used to that. We're ready. We're you ready. have Clinton on your side with this? We do. He's uh, supportive. Obviously, his wife is uh, focused on a job search right now. So yeah. Uh, we're being respectful for that. Uh, it would be wonderful if she was president in 2017 because I think she'd be an unbelievable asset for us to, to convince yeah. IOC voters to trust trust America and trust Los Angeles. But we all know Lincoln Chafee's going to win. I mean, do you <laughs> we, have a relationship with Lincoln Chafee I yet don't, or no? And uh, we do. You might want to build that. We do joke about Donald Trump being president. That might be a little scary. It's. I'm not, it's not even as much of a joke anymore. I think no. it's, it's in play. <laughs> that's, the, that's the problem. It's now mid-October. Talking about a humble American bid and Donald Trump as the president doesn't quite work. It might not work. No. It might be in trouble. Now, what about, so Obama's going to be out of office in like a year. Correct. Is that somebody who could potentially be involved with this or uh, not? Obama has a complicated relationship with the IOC, given that one of his first things he did when he got elected president was 
go to Copenhagen um, and speak on behalf of Chicago bidding for the games. American, uh, sitting American president goes to pitch for the games for his hometown, and uh, they got knocked out in the first round. So there's a little history there. Um, That's not good. It's not about blame. It's just a fact. It is what it is. And uh, so in 2017, I'm not sure that Obama will be at the top of our list. He's obviously um, will be out of office. Um, but He's going to want to go to the games. <laughs> who knows? He might be living here by then. Maybe. Or Maybe. be in Hawaii or, or who New knows? York, probably. You think? I think. I think he'll stay in Washington for a couple of years because of the kids. And then maybe, who knows, maybe he'll be here. Who else do you need? What other, what other power brokers? Well, I think, I think the good thing about LA is we have a lot of people here who have connections to the world in very meaningful ways. So, yeah. uh, you know, our, our ability to reach people uh, around the world and, and connect ourselves to them uh, is LA is a place that, that IOC members. This is the biggest answer to, ever. Love, love, love to come visit. Yeah. Well, telling people our strategy about connecting yeah, with yeah, the members, yeah, probably yeah. not a All really right, good, good idea, right. but <laughs> we'll deploy you. How about that? Well, I'd Don't like mind. to be, I'd like to be involved. Okay. I really think the LA Olympics is going to be a huge success, but I don't think, as I said, I don't think any other city, it would have worked. I, agree I with really you. think it would have been, you pick a city, it would have gone badly. And, uh, and just from what I saw in London, it's so hard to pull off the degree of difficulty, the amount of people, um, how malleable the city has to be, how much distance you need from different places, you know? And the thing with the Olympics, and I realized this and I wrote about it about halfway through when I was there in 2012 is you're never going to get to everything. And you, you realize that eventually it's like, oh, I can't go to the gymnastics and then the boxing and then the cycling <laughs> because they're in three different spots that are all an hour away from each other. There, there is distance. And that's why I think LA works more than anything. The it, football stadium is kind of a godsend though. You have to admit it could be, I mean, you cool. would have had to have built that stadium. Probably not. You don't but think the, so? the cool thing is, if if it's the stadium in Englewood, and if they do in fact put a roof on it, allows you to do some pretty interesting things in a place like LA, in a in a facility that's that new and that unique with a roof on it that you otherwise couldn't do. You were always rumored with NFL teams here, and now it seems like we're getting two teams, <laughs> or three, or four. <laughs> Man, we just we be football there constantly on Saturdays and Sundays. You were not involved with any of these NFL stuff, or you are, or maybe possibly. No, look. Uh, the thing that's happened, which is the thing that always should have happened, uh, which is why there's more traction about the NFL coming back to LA now than there has been a long time, is to, to, to attract a team to LA without actually owning a team is a really hard thing to do. Yep. And so now what you have is you have three owners who have said, we are moving our teams to LA. And the proof that the NFL understands this now is whether it's true or not, this sort of concept of a flip tax. They want these owners to move their teams and own those teams in those markets. And if you're an owner, if you own the Oakland Raiders or the St. Louis Rams or the San Diego Chargers, why would you move to arguably one of the most valuable places in the world and then sell your team? It's illogical. And so owners have now exhausted most of their opportunities in their existing markets. The teams that in theory were um, in challenging situations before have resolved their situations, Minnesota, yeah. Buffalo. And so now you've got three teams really focused on this challenge. They all have interesting connections to LA in different ways. So you don't see any of those teams actually selling if they moved here? I don't. I think it's important that they don't because I think those NFL owners want those uh, people who moved to LA to be committed and focused and not use this as a way to enrich themselves because it's very hard to convince, I believe, 31 owners to allow one or two owners, so maybe 30 or 31 owners, to move a team to LA based on your vote and your support and then go sell that team and keep 100% of the proceeds from that opportunity. They want their owners committed and focused on this for the right reasons for the long term, not as a means to just get rich quickly. So what's your prediction for which two teams? Do you have one? Of course I have one. Um, Which is, I know you have way too much inside information probably on this, but. I think you have an interesting dynamic. Uh, Two owners coming together, obviously, you know, the NFL is a three quarters vote league. So eight owners can stop anything. Yeah. Uh, Having two owners together is an interesting voting dynamic. Uh, Stan's economic position and ability to eliminate a lot of the risk from building the stadium is obviously fundamental with the Rams and Inglewood. Uh, Dean Spanos is a highly respected owner in the league. And so he's got a lot of friends who would like to see him 
benefit from his commitment to the league over a long period of time and doing this the right way. Right. People like Spanos. People do yeah. like Dean, and he and he's a, a wonderful guy. Uh, so I don't think you've seen the last move in sort of which teams come together at which location. Um, you know, is I, it bittersweet for you because you had always wanted to bring a football team here and build a stadium, and now it just seems like Crocky's doing it. Well, and that's it. It's bittersweet, except I grew up going to football games. I love uh, the NFL. I love professional football, and there's a whole generation of people in the city who've never gone to a professional. I know, football is that game. amazing? It's crazy. It's crazy. My and it's also crazy that people think that it wouldn't work here. I, I'm the opposite. I, I feel like, first of all, the suites and all that stuff would be sold out to the gills. Like well, you're going to sell all those. But then there's a whole blue collar middle class element. And those are the people that would love going to these games. I mean, look at freaking soccer. Right. And think the about soccer and sells think out about left this. and right. Nobody in Los Angeles has ever seen a professional vo football game in this city. True. In a modern stadium. Right. The only two locations they've ever seen professional football are the Rose Bowl and the Coliseum. Not the greatest experiences. And to me... Well, right? the Rose Bowl is a great experience, but it's not. Not. It's the, not the least modern experience. Things. Yeah. It's basically and, just rows that go up for a million rows. And, and to me, the proof point is your favorite team, the Clippers. The Clippers went from begging a thousand people to go My to games at the, team. How dare you? at the sports arena yeah. to selling out at Staples Center. So I think people in LA are cynical until they're not. And given a world-class experience, they will be totally embrace uh, of the, the steam. Now, the other thing, let's just do the math. There's 15, 20 million people in Southern California. If it's a 70,000 seat stadium, everyone buys two or three tickets. You only need 20,000 people to buy tickets. It's not that complicated. Yeah, it, they'll definitely sell. To sell out every game. It also opens up Super Bowl every five years. Super Bowls are important. If Stan builds his stadium with a roof, uh, you'll have a Final Four in LA, which hasn't been here since the 60s. I mean, think about that. That's amazing. You uh, might, it opens up World Cup possibilities again. Massive, massive event opportunities. You could have college football kickoff games, which we don't have in LA. Um, there's a whole host of things. Maybe there's a way to get UCLA and USC to play some neutral site games, which would be really awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, they do that in other big rivalries. So there's a lot that you can WrestleMania. do. With, with WrestleMania. Don't forget WrestleMania. Hosted by Bill Simmons. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That'll probably be my next job after <laughs> HBO. Could be worse. <laughs> It'd be great. <laughs> It'll be a sideline reporter at WrestleMania. The, uh, Oh, and then we left out. There's one other thing that would happen in a giant stadium. Um, oh, boxing. Boxing. And then concerts. And massive concerts. Massive concerts. 80,000. I mean, you know, now we're entering the era where who could sell out an 80,000 seat stadium? There's only like four or five people. Well, at least one of them. Taylor Swift would. And you two. And there you, you two. go. That's all you need. <laughs> you two comes out in walkers and wheelchairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. Very interesting time. Wait, we got to talk hoops really quick. I'm ready. So your agency, um, when did you start? When did you make your MBA run? When we acquired our Tellum's business nine years ago. Uh, so we had no NBA business. Uh, and we you just have a slew of NBA players now that everybody's heard of. We do. Anthony including Davis. Including the next great player. Anthony Davis, your guy. The reason someone should buy the Pelicans, right? Uh, Russell Westbrook. I was Westbrook. telling you. <laughs> Russell Westbrook, Derek Rose. We've got an unbelievable uh, roster. Jabari Parker uh, uh, of talented NBA LaMarcus, players. Uh, LaMarcus. Just cashed in. Um, you know, the Gasols. So it's an unbelievable group. You of love the Gasols. I, how can you not love the Gasols? Those are your, those are the, you can't pick favorites, but you love the Gasols. How can you not love the Gasols? You love the Gasols. Uh, Pass the best. spot for Anthony, though. Yeah. He seems like a, like a genuinely nice guy. He's a wonderful guy. He likes hanging out with my kids. He likes coming over. I mean, he's as good a person as you could imagine. And he's obviously an unbelievable basketball player. People laughed at me because I was saying, I thought, I thought New Orleans should be considered a legit contender. And they're like 50 to one or something to win the NBA title. And people are like, New Orleans, get out of here. It's like, look, the law of the league is when somebody's going to be great, like all time great, they have a year before you think the year is going to happen. And all of a sudden, they're like in the conference finals. You're like, wait a second, this guy's 23. How is this happening? I think that could happen for him this year. I totally agree. And we happen to have, uh, uh, I think, eight players on the Pelicans we represent. So uh, right. it's like Wasserman East a little bit. You know, Drew Holiday and Tyreek. Well, you and, have the whole Holiday family, right? Don't we you do. even represent their kids? We do. And Lauren. Yeah. So we've got the entire. That's my favorite couple. <laughs> Drew and Lauren. Yeah. And they went to UCLA. So how bad can they be? Well, but like, she's the eighth best women's soccer player in America and he was a point guard good enough to get traded for two lottery picks and I want I want stock in their kids I, I completely agree don't so you do think I, I'm in 
I want Sokka. It feels like they might produce the next great American child. Because we could never convince Serena and LeBron to have like two kids. Because that would have been it. It's over if Serena and LeBron just say, screw it. We need to win every Olympics in 2044. 44, when yeah. would that be? Yes. Yeah, well, like you know, I mean, Drew's side of the family obviously has his brothers are good basketball players. I mean, it's a pretty remarkable family. So being in this whole agency business for a while, you've seen some shady things, <laughs> some seedy things, some things that probably turn your stomach a little bit. What's the biggest misconception about sports agents that you feel like? Well, I think the one thing that's changed a lot about the business, and I, and I try and tell our agents this, and I try and tell our clients this all the time, the value of an agent in many ways isn't, def isn't about success. When people are really successful, things are pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, they get paid well. They earn um, dollars off the court or off the field. The value of agents and the experience that we have uh, and, that, and the history of work that we have is about when things don't go well. And things don't always go well. There's like with Derrick Rose the last couple of years. There are lots of uh, ups and downs and being able to be consistent over a long period of time with your clients and give them advice that's in their best interest because I own this business. Uh, we're not selling this business. We have no pressure to do things for financial reasons. We do things that's in the best interest of the clients, period. Yeah. And you combine that with the experience we have in dealing with all sorts of situations, that's where you define value. Now, the challenge is when you're 20 years old, no one wants to talk to you about the bad things. Right. They only want to tell you about the great things that are going to happen to you. And the truth is, it's very rare that there's always a perfect straight line that goes only one way and that's up. Uh, and so, you know, our job is to be present. Uh, there are clearly going to be athletes we're not going to represent because that's not what they're looking for in an agent. Uh, we think that the kind of players we represent across the board, and we represent 1,500 athletes in 30 sports around the world, um, have the character uh, and the commitment and the perspectives that we share, and that's why we represent them, and that's why the relationship works. So you're not like, you're not on the Louisville cam Louisville campus, like <laughs> helping out the hookers with extra stuff. Like that's not you're not on that side. No, I think I think we'll stay uh, far, <laughs> far away from that. Um, and look, that doesn't mean there's aren't lots of weird things that go on in the world. And but it's getting weirder. I mean, you're talking about high school juniors are getting money now from agents and high school sophomores, and it it seems it, like the whole business is shadier, 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 shadier. It it is. It the the challenge with the business is. Agents are the only ones who are regulated. Kind of an odd thing to think about, you know. Yeah. Uh, advisors, friends, none of those people are regulated or monitored. Um, there's, uh, especially in football, there's just so many players on so many campuses. Um, in, in basketball, the difference is for the first round, you've got 30 picks. Maybe there's 40 people who end up in those 30 picks. There's yeah. not 400 people who become those 30. So there's a lot of scrutiny and a lot of focus and a lot of attention. So I would actually argue, while there's crazy stuff happens, it's maybe less rampant in basketball than people assume. But football, there's a lot more opportunity. So I, we don't really represent football players except Andrew Luck. But there's a lot that happens out there. And the challenge is then you've got other sports, like tennis, where there's no rules. You can I can go recruit a 12-year-old in Croatia today and yeah. pay him or her whatever I want. You should and, do that. And do their training. Yeah, well, fortunately, uh, <laughs> uh, we'll stay away from, away yeah, from that. But then that's a sport where there's no rules because yeah. there's no college infrastructure that you know changes their eligibility. And so it's a really uneven world. Uh, soccer, same thing in Europe. You know, Professional teams, forget about agents, Chelsea signs 10-year-old players. Yeah. Which is crazy. So you, you've got a lot out there. It's really uneven. Uh, it's really um, nuanced and... You, you know, doubled down on soccer a while ago. We did. You know, we're very fortunate. You got a, you had a lot of those dudes we, and ladies. We have uh, we had eight members of the U.S. Women's National Team, which we're very proud of. We have a really strong women's sports practice in general. I think it's hard to be in the sports business and ignore fifty percent of the population. Yeah. Um, and so we're very focused on that. You know, Sylvia Fowles, Maya Moore from the WNBA champion links last night. Uh, but soccer, if you want to be myopic, you don't see this, but it's the biggest sport in the world, no question. Uh, and so if you want to be in the sports business and you don't want to be in the biggest sport in the world, I'm not sure what you're doing. And for us, that's all about the United States where we have a really big practice. Uh, but also we represent a player on every Premier League team, every Dutch team, uh, and, and represent 400 players playing in Europe. And it's the biggest sport in the world and it's only getting bigger. So what, been... what happens with American soccer? I mean, you, you're involved with a lot of this stuff and it seems like it's, it's definitely a pro sport. It's respected. Um, 
people still care more i feel like about premier league and bundesliga all that stuff but it's definitely above triple a baseball it's not quite where maybe hockey is but it's closer to hockey than i think people realize because now they're getting you know they put the way where they put the stadiums and the teams they're getting good crowds no. they're getting as many as like a hockey as a hockey crowd no question i i think a few things about soccer in this country number one uh americans like to be the best at things so to me yeah. I think a true inflection point is one of two things happening. Either the best player in the world is an American, which, by the way, means he's playing in Europe. Or... But we could at least follow him now on ESPN2 at 6 in the morning, no, but we could at least watch him. No question. Or the U.S. team has an extraordinary result at a World Cup, a semifinal appearance. Now, neither of those things happen without the investment and the infrastructure that MLS has built over the last 20 years. But that's not entirely dependent on the success of MLS. Yeah. Right? They have invested in the sport. The other thing that is interesting about the soccer in this country, and obviously your kids and mine are beneficiaries of this, they can watch the best teams in the world, like you just said, it's at, at a normal time of day. Game it, changer. And it, and so waking up for our kids and watching Chelsea or Man U or Real Madrid or Juventus, or wh whatever they care about, they can watch on channels they're used to watching. They know these players from playing FIFA on their video games. They are, their sports center now talks about soccer around the world. And soccer has a huge advantage that no one talks about, which is the time zone difference. So the best teams in the world play in Europe. The biggest untapped market in the world is the United States. Those games played at their normal time show up at very normal times in our country. Take NBA, for example. The opposite is true. You play NBA at night in this country, which is when you should be playing it. It's in the morning at weird times in Europe and in Asia. And that's it's why there'll natural. never be a London NBA team. Correct. It's yeah. a really odd thing. And so you flip that for soccer. It's a huge advantage. So. MLS has built a great base and great foundation. Uh, we continue to develop talent. That talent will then continue to play in Europe. And, you know. Well, two it, other things help too. HD and the widescreen, just the TVs. It's more fun to watch soccer than it used to be. Yep. Now you can actually see the layout of the formations and stuff. And then the fact that it's two hours. I totally agree with you. The, 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 the two hours thing is amazing. And know, it's you, the biggest advantage they have. Yeah, You, you go to a game and if, for people who don't go to games, you know. We're used to going to baseball games or football games. You get up, you go to the bathroom, you go buy some t-shirts. I mean, when I go to soccer games in Europe, the team store is not even open during the game. Right. Because literally, you can't even buy a beer in the seats because it would interfere with the 45 minutes of the halves. Like, you don't get up, no one moves. It's this, for an American sports fan, it's a really crazy experience. But that two hours is unbelievable. And it's focused and you know what you're getting. And, and I actually think what used to be a disadvantage for soccer has now become a huge advantage. And also, um, it's just nice to know, like with the baseball playoffs, right? Like Dodgers, Mets tonight. That might be four and a half hours of my life. <laughs> it might be three hours. It might be five hours. Or you can have a 20 minute review about a rule that no one knew about like last yeah. night. And <laughs> or you might have the eighth inning, like the, I watched Astros Royals game three and the eighth inning took 17 hours to play. And it's like in soccer two hours i'm done unless there's extra time and penalty kicks which we had on saturday we at least had the extra time that was an awesome game unbelievable the usa mexico it was unbelievable and that's the thing is they figured out now how to have these little tournaments and games that mean something when the world cup's not even happening um i like it but here's something i don't really like shaving do you like shaving hate shaving when i was doing basketball when did the, the nba countdown and you had to shave on tv and I would just wrap. I'm the worst shaver in college. <laughs> in college, my roommates used to, when I would shave, they would come in and open the door because I'd be like covered with shaving cream and it would just be terrible. So I hate shaving. Uh, I never know what shaving cream to buy. I never know what razors to use. I never know when to stop using one razor and move to a fresher one. How do you know? I don't know. How do I know when my razor's done? Uh, I'm just bad at it. Well, Harry's.com is winning over people like me. It's a company started by two guys who are passionate about creating a better shaving experience for all men. Their starter kit is just $15, includes the razor, three blades, and your choice of hairy shaving cream or foaming shave gel. See, I don't even know what to do there with shave cream versus the shave gel. Like, nobody's ever walked me through that. Harry's will walk you through that. A superior shave for an incredible price. They bought a razor factory in Germany that's been crafting one of the, some of the world's highest quality blades for almost a century. And then when you travel, do you like take all that with you or do you oh, use yeah. the local? I mean, it's a whole yeah. thing. That's, that's, that's Harry's going to help you with that stuff. Uh, as an added bonus, you get $5 off your first purchase with my coupon code BS. That's an entire month's worth of shaving for $10 free shipping. 
So what are you waiting for? Stop ravaging your face. Stop overpaying for your shaves. Harry's.com. Use coupon code BS when you check out. You won't regret it. I've never figured out how to properly shave. I would go, when I did Countdown, I would, I would, I would go in and the makeup, I'd have like all these cuts in my neck. They'd have to put all these weird bombs on me and then like cake my face and stuff. All right, so back to um, the agent thing really quick. Um, so you see something like, can we talk about the DeAndre thing or no? Is that bad no, for you? We can talk about it. That's all right. So you see something like that happening. You're just you're not involved at all. Correct. You have Dan Fagan, who clearly has a good relationship with Mark Cuban. You have DeAndre and the Clippers, and then we all knew that that was pretty toxic. You have Chandler Parsons, <laughs> who's basically the broker for the Mavericks, which is somehow the NBA has said that that's legal somehow. Um, he's taking. DeAndre out all over the place in LA. He goes to a club one night. Mark Cuban happens to be there in a back room. Like this was like one of the all time shady things ever. And he signs, then he changes his mind. What, like when you're watching this, are you just like, thank God this isn't us? Or do we need to change the rules here? What's your reaction? Or can you not comment? Certainly happy it wasn't us. Cause yeah, that would have uh, been a disaster. That's a, good, that's a good place to start. Uh, the thing that's actually most remarkable is usually when those things happen, it doesn't get undone. Like that's a really right. rare thing. You know, the, the, the thing happens and you're like, you talk about it, but it sort of never undoes itself so that you can't figure out if it was shady or not, or what really happened. And the fact that Deandre and I give him a lot of credit for this sort of took a step back yeah, and, and really on his own, I believe, started to think about what was happening and his decision and how the decision came to be and the influence and all that stuff. He deserves a lot of credit because most players, one, wouldn't do that. And two, don't have the guts to do that. That was a really hard thing for a player to do, to turn your back on a team, on your own agent. Right. I mean, it's a real, uh, there was a lot that happened there that was pretty remarkable. And so he, DeAndre deserves a lot of credit. I'm not going to comment on, on competitive agents. Um, I figured. But, you know, uh, it, was, it was a really interesting situation to watch. I was absolutely glad it wasn't me. It was sort of like watching a soap opera from knowing just enough to make it really interesting. I thought the Mavs were really smart with, cause I, I saw it at game seven of the Spurs Clippers series, DeAndre didn't play the last six minutes, crunch time of the biggest game of the year. And you could see his body language. And if I'm the Mavs and I need a center and I have Chandler Parsons, I'm spending the entire month of June going, yeah, Chris Paul's a dick. <laughs> Chris Paul told a friend of mine that they can't throw you the ball and your free throws suck. And you come to us, we'll make you our guy. We'll run, they don't run plays for you. They never posted you up. You just do that for a month, and after a while, DeAndre's like, yeah. Yeah, Chris Paul's a dick, you're right. <laughs> yeah, they never ran plays for me. Yeah, I should go. And then I think, like you said, he, he was like, yeah, all right, I'll sign. And then a day later, he's like, wait a second, what did I do? Why am I gonna leave Los Angeles? And I'm a single multimillionaire in Los Angeles, having a great time. Why am I leaving? It's true, and I, I, I give him a lot of credit. It was a really fascinating thing, and ultimately, you and I both love the NBA. It was good for the NBA. I mean, there's a lot of talk about it. it. People got excited about it. You know, it's that's the thing. Adam loves that stuff. Like he likes when they they had like a seven week stretch where nothing happened from basically the end of July all the way through September. I think he like he probably likes having the calm, but at the same time, like it, can you remember a time when nobody was talking about the NBA for seven weeks? I mean, and then the NBA nothing. erupted an emoji war. Yeah, yeah. And then it, it, it ended up on TV. It was amazing. Yeah. So. So you lost Arn Tellum. We did. Maybe lost is the wrong word. You knew he was going to leave. So I always thought Arn Tellum was by far the best agent. I, I actually thought he could have been like the president. Like if there was a sports czar, <laughs> if Obama said, I'm going to have a sports czar, I think Arn Tellum is clearly the choice. I was always so impressed by him especially the deals that he got for people that were just insane. It's like, wow. They're, they're paying $50 million for a center who's averaging nine points and seven rebounds. Some of my favorite communication with you is about some of those deals. Oh my, I just thought like, this guy's the best. He's getting 20 million bucks more for everybody. So he leaves, that's gotta be bad for you, right? How do you survive that one? So a couple things and, and one, this was Arn's decision. He's always had a passion and go run a team. You He's knew it was happening at some point. We thought it would happen, uh, and he obviously has a, a connection to Michigan and Detroit, uh, and this is his passion. He's one of my closest friends. We talk all the time. I'm thrilled for him. He's happy, and yeah. that's what matters. Uh, but 
as a testament to Arn, Thad Fouché, BJ Armstrong, Darren Matsubara, our basketball business, you think about any other agency in any other sport and the singular person left, there would be no business left. Yeah. None. Our business is thriving. Our free agency, we did $750 million of free agent deals That's after amazing. he left. So we have an unbelievable business. It's the business that Arn built. We're fortunate enough to have kept that business after he left. That's a result. You had no idea he was going to be this good, right, for you? I mean, when you hired him, you knew he was the best, but you didn't realize that he was going to immediately swing the balance. No, and, and what Arn did for us more than anything at the time we did the deal was he changed people's perception about our business. Yeah. Um, and we'll be forever grateful for that because it, it elevated us to a place where we weren't. We were playing in an area in action sports and some of these niche things that people didn't, frankly, respect as much as they do today. But Arn Tellum elevated our company in a way that very few other people could have. He's one of the few true multi-sport agents at success. So baseball and basketball, obviously. And, you know, the legacy he leaves behind is an unbelievable group of agents. Um, Adam Katz and Joel Wolf and our baseball team is unbelievable. Uh, we've got some of the best young talent in baseball. And I love watching the playoffs because one of our young guys like Javi Baez, you know, uh, um, playing unbelievable. And he's 20 years old. Um, you know, Gene Carlos Stanton. We've got these this unbelievable team. Yes, we represent Chase Utley, and we can talk about that if you oh. want. <laughs> we can talk about that if Man. you want. But we've got an unbelievable thing, and that's that's. You what... represent somebody else that we 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 probably shouldn't talk about. Uh oh, somebody that might have signed with my favorite baseball team last winter. We don't need to talk about that. Yeah, we don't need to talk about that. Um, so, you know, his legacy is obviously the work he did, but in many ways, his legacy is the people he left. It's the Staying best the agent company. ever. I think some people think David Falk was the best agent ever just because he had Jordan. But I think Arn, if you just went deal by deal, what he got for people and, and how loyal. I mean, you guys really didn't lose anybody when he was there. We didn't. didn't seem and right, by the right? way, we, you know, a few guys leave here and there after he left, all to be expected. Yeah. But unbelievable uh, retention of clients. All the agents are staying. Uh, I think we'll have a very good... Uh, few years ahead of us and prove to people that you know what we built as a company uh has been institutionalized a lot based on what arn has left behind and that's a really valuable thing for us and uh now is it weird to own an agency that represents so many basketball players that are that prominent but you're also close with adam silver look i i'm a huge fan of adam and and because i'm not technically an agent you know right um, you just kind of uh, I think it's good. Adam and I have but a friendship. But you're in inner circle with him a little bit, right? I mean, well, he leans on you for stuff. I don't know that he leans on, on me. Maybe literally leans on me because he's so much taller than we are. But <laughs> uh, look, uh, you can't have anything but a great amount of respect for Adam as a person and as now as a commissioner. He's done an incredible job. He's been a friend for a long time. And look, he is charged with creating success for the NBA. And that benefits everyone in the NBA. Players, fans, sponsors. Uh, um, teams and, and for us we're a part of that and I think these people who think that we shouldn't talk to each other or agents uh, it's crazy we're all right. here for the same thing which is the success of basketball and right. Adam is as good a person as we could literally have in that job and that's good for the business of basketball and any way that we can help that that doesn't mean players and teams may not be at odds or the league and t players may not be at odds at some point but that's natural and you can't be in a business that's complicated and connected and not have those moments. But my view is, you know, we're not majoring in the minors here. We need to focus on the big issues and the big opportunities. And that's good for everybody. And there's a real chance here for the NBA to, you know, especially as the NFL continues. Although the NFL's never been more popular than ever, but <laughs> the NFL has all these different weird obstacles and shady things going on. And the NBA really doesn't have anything. I mean, the, the NBA is probably never been positioned. In, a, in a better position. No yeah. question The the players, the teams, the ownership, the league, the, 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 the importance of the league. The well, what about the marketability of the players? Right? So, I mean, so I would say your most famous clients right now are Anthony Davis, Derek uh, Rose, Russell, Russell, Those are but like, all right, players. let's take Mark Gasol who's you know probably the best center in the league i would say more people would recognize mark gasol if he walked into a place like forget about how tall he is than mike trout no question and mike trout is the best baseball player probably the last 40 years <laughs> offensively and yet mark gasol who's not even one of the 20 most recognizable basketball players is way more famous than mike trout look the same 
the same assets and attributes that made Michael Jordan who he is and what is apply to all NBA players. And now the NBA is doing an unbelievable job of exploiting that for all its players, which is they wear the same shoes that we can go buy at a store. We see their faces. They play a sport that's accessible and playable kind of anywhere in the world. And with the job they've done in marketing their players, forcing their teams to be better operators, the quality of teams have gotten dramatically better. And obviously social media has connected these players to fans in a way that never existed before. And Marcus it's the perfect, Saul, yeah, it's a perfect a internet sport. Doesn't even want particularly to be marketed in that way. He's happy to play basketball and do his things. And he's very committed to their foundation and the things that are important to him and pal personally, he's, as you said, as recognizable player, maybe the best center in the NBA. And that's a testament to the system that the NBA has developed and built over a long time. And a foreign guy. And okay. that's the other thing is they they have this whole foreign population of talent now. Like, do you have Hazonia? I can't remember. We do. Oh, you do have Hazonia. Super Mario is... 18-1 to one for Rookie of the Year. I love that. I can't bet on it, but I love it. Is he going to get... Is he going to play 30 minutes a game? He's got to, right? I mean, he is a unique talent. He's unbelievable. I love Hazonia. I remember when you told me you signed him, I was like, oh, I like this guy. I saw him on YouTube. He's, he's a, a human star highlight potential. Reel. He yeah. is a human highlight reel. And, and uh, I bet the Knicks fans... Well, I actually think Porzingis is going to be pretty good too, because he's like Rick Smith's, but can shoot threes. <laughs> like he's he's hopefully interesting. his feet are better. Hopefully with Smith's. better feet. Yeah. But I do think there's a chance that Hazonia will do a couple things in that first month, and the Knicks fans are going to be like, "Wait a second, we, wait, did, did he went after we, uh oh, yeah." And that could get ugly. That do could, you have Justice Winslow or no? No. He's I, another one who might no, be a star. No, no. Crush. I like this draft class. This could be a really, if you look back in five years, this could be a draft class that people are going to have a different perspective on, I think. And look, even what Mario did in, in Summer League, there were a couple of things he did in Summer League that were unbelievable. He, he's a guy who could win the dunk contest and the three-point contest. Um, how worried should I be about Derrick Rose? Because, I, I mean, I didn't want to talk about the off-the-court stuff because I don't know all the facts and, you know, the legal system has to play that out. But he's taking a lot of hits here. He was somebody that in 2011, I think, was the most popular athlete locally of any NBA player for their city. And now it's like he keeps getting hurt. He, he's talking about a contract extension. Like what, like, what do you tell somebody like that who clearly seems to be going through a lot of stuff? Look, I think the, the challenge is people forgot why they fell in love with Derek in the first place because of the injuries. Uh, yeah. And, and you go back to 2011 when he was MVP. What he did on the court was remarkable. And how hard he played. That was like when you saw him in person, no, him and Westbrook were the two where you're like, Jesus, off the these chart. guys are going to get hurt. Off the chart. Stop it. Calm down. And so look at Derek. Give him a full year of basketball. Give him uh, time to get back into his element of what he loves and does best. And I think a lot of the noise will go away. The challenge is when you don't have the other stuff, people focus so much more on things that otherwise wouldn't be a big deal. And so, so he just needs three months of good games. Correct. And I think you'll see that from him. He's, as, right. he's in as good a shape. I've known Derek a long time. He's in as good a shape as I've ever seen. Mentally, he's really good. Uh, you know, He's in a good place. New coach. A new coach, who I think is going to be great, who we also represent. So that's exciting. Ah, the mayor. Uh, the mayor. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, I, think, I think a good year for the Bulls will make everyone take a deep breath. Russell Westbrook, has he has he pulled the stick out of his butt yet, or what? Why is he so mad at everybody? We all love you, Russell Westbrook. We love watching you play basketball. Stop it! It's, it's what makes Russell tick. You know, he gets on the court and he's like uh, Clark Kent and Superman. He becomes a different guy. And he but really, he's he, not like that in in private, though. He's like the nicest guy ever, completely right? Completely the opposite. The nicest, humble. He comes to our off. I mean, in the off season, yeah. he literally comes to our office every day and just hangs out. Literally hangs out and. Spends time with people and going to get Chinese food orders for lunch for the staff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then he gets on the court. It's like a, he's like a different person, and he's he is a remarkable talent. And I thought I think what you saw, and I know you talked about it last year, is that team really rallied around him when when KD was hurt, and yeah. he put that team on his shoulders and did stuff that people didn't think was possible, and got that team closer to making the playoffs than anybody expected. Yeah, I wonder. I um, we really that's the most fascinating team. No question. Durant had three surgeries last year. Everybody's just penciling them in as a title contender. I'd like to see him play for two straight months. And by the way, on the same injury, which is always a scary yes. thing for players. And it was obviously misdiagnosed, and they rushed him back. And it's like the Des Bryant thing. These people, they break their foot, and they're like, yeah, he'll be back in four to six weeks. It's like, what? <laughs> it's his foot. 
you that that just gets worse like take your time take 12 weeks and you know think about this season that team is so talented they have a new coach which will be billy donovan will be an interesting character to watch they've got a great staff but they seem very tense already they the the pressure around the durant situation will be unique and then the durant what, what he does is not just about him because it will have implications and i'm not even sure what they are for a whole bunch of other players including russell so there's a lot at stake and but they've already showed us that I mean, we're not even in the season yet, and he can't handle people talking about it. And, you know, the Stephen A thing, <laughs> which everybody focused on the part that he threatened him, which he did, and that, how just bizarre that was and strange that they didn't disappoint him <laughs> or any of that. It was just like, how is this happening? But what he was saying before all that stuff happened was actually a really good point. It's like, these guys are too sensitive about stuff. You're public figures. People are going to talk about you. You're on social media. You have shoe contracts. You have all these different things. You're going to be discussed. You're going to be criticized. And it seems like that team is, is just kind of had it with everybody. You know, yeah. stop talking about us. Stop talking about where Kevin's going to go. And it's like, no. Where Kevin's going to go is the biggest story of the year. We're all going to keep talking about this. Like, you got to get used to it. And I, th I think what teams ought to do is, and it's hard, understood it's hard if you're the Oklahoma City Thunder, it's a hard thing to do. You got to give them a reason to stay, not be insecure about why they might leave. And yep. the NBA has done an unbelievable job because what the NBA has now is 30 competitive teams. Financially, operationally, you know, Kevin Durant is as big a star as there is and he plays in Oklahoma City. It doesn't should, matter where he plays. They should embrace that. Yeah. They should own that. And, and he can be a big fish and his pond is not Oklahoma City. His pond is the NBA. And maybe even bigger than that, given the kind of person he is. And so if I were the Thunder, I'd be embracing this year because it's a year to show Kevin how much you love him and how much he can stay. And as we all know, that means a lot to players. And also like 30 years ago, we see these guys four times a year during the season. They're on two CBS games and maybe one USA game and one ESPN game and that's it. Now we can watch them 82 times a year. When Russell Westbrook dunks over somebody, it's on my Twitter feed in five minutes in a vine. It doesn't matter where they play. And as you said, when the season ends, they're in LA anyway. No question. Or they're in Las Vegas or New York. It doesn't matter where you play. If if they're all happy there, they're all going to stay in OKC. My thing is, hey, I, for them, I, I think the Harden trade, the fact that they both bought in and they signed deals, and they signed deals under certain pretenses, and then with James Harden over eight million bucks or whatever, they trade him. I, 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 that's the part I'm interested to see if that rears its ugly head because at some point that's a real thing that you went to the 2012 finals those three guys were tight those guys those three guys were like yeah we lost to Miami this time but we're gonna have the rest of the decade to do our thing and then they changed the terms and that's the part I would be worried about if I was an Oklahoma City fan but if they win the title this year they're not leaving Durant's not leaving no and and It'll be very interesting to, to see how this all, all happens. And, and what people forget is if you're a player, what matters to you is your teammates. Yes. Your coach. And winning. And winning. And your practice facility. I mean, where you spend 90% of your time is that thing. It's, yeah. it's not all the other stuff. And so getting that right, which I think Billy Donovan has a really unique opportunity to do there and change the culture a little bit and embrace Kevin maybe in a way that's different and make yeah. him feel comfortable. That's what players want. Because as you said, in the off season, Kevin can live in LA, no problem, and have a great life. And then he gets to an environment where he's completely comfortable and happy if that's what it is in Oklahoma City. And that's what I think makes players tick when you remove the stuff that used to exist, which is Oklahoma City is no different than LA and New York now. Yeah. And they're there for seven months, but they're on the road half the time. Correct. Season ends and they leave. So it doesn't really matter. I I'm, I'm interested to see how it plays that. out. I mean, there might be, let's be honest, there might it might be time for both of those guys to have their own team. What Westbrook might be like, you know what? I just want my own team where I get to shoot at the end of games. I don't want to defer to somebody else. That's in play. It's possible. Or they might decide, you give me my best chance to keep winning 60 games a year and win the title. Let's stay together. I don't know how it's going to play out. My point is, I think we should be allowed to talk about this. Not just you and me, but just in general. <laughs> this is going to be a dominant theme of the season. It, it is. Where is he going to go? And whether they like it or not, it's going to be that way. Yeah. All right, so LA2024, you have a website yet? We do, la2024.org. 
Uh, our plans are up there, uh, ways for people to get engaged and excited. Uh, we're, we're excited to be on this journey for two years. And uh, I will tell you that one of the most important things that the IOC looks at is public support and public engagement. And so people in the community and LA being involved and passionate and caring about what we're doing is a really important thing for our success. Well, you know, I'm on board. I'm, I'm, I'm an unofficial sponsor. <laughs> Do you have, you have official sponsors yet? We don't. But right. I was thinking stamps.com, maybe we could like send medals to people when we win. Totally. You can measure them on a digital yeah. scale. Do you agree with my idea with the Olympic medals that they should be different sizes depending on how important the event is? <laughs> I'm not sure that goes going to go over well with the IOC. But. Like if you win the 100 yard dash, that should that should be like a Flava Flav medal. <laughs> but maybe Flava Flav should design it too. But like you know, beach volleyball. I don't know. Maybe a little bit smaller than the 100 yard dash. Let's figure out something out with that. All right, I'll leave that to you. Thanks again to Harrys.com for their support of the Bill Simmons podcast. Go to Harrys.com right now. Get $5 off with my code BS on your first purchase of their awesome razors. H-A-R-R-Y-S.com. Coupon code BS at checkout. $5 off their starter set. Start shaving smarter today. And also thanks as well to Stamps.com for a four-week trial plus a $110 bonus offer, including postage and a digital scale. Go to Stamps.com. Click on that microphone at the top of the homepage. Type in BS. Stamps.com. Enter BS. Casey Wasserman, thank you so much. We'll be back on the uh, Bill Simmons podcast tomorrow with Joe House, NFL, NBA. And I think we're going to call my dad because uh, he's upset that I, he feels like I, I libeled him with my, with my comments about how he felt about Tom Brady. But he did turn on him, just for the record. He really? did. So we might call on him, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, check out, I did the Mike Francesa show and I did Toucher and Rich in Boston. And those links are online. Those were really fun. I was finally able to do a couple radio interviews outside the whole ESPN umbrella. And it was Safe doing it from LA when you talk yeah, about was, Boston Olympics like that. Oh yeah. It was, it was they agreed though. Did Everyone they? in Boston